Well, thank you very much for coming to the meeting tonight. I know it sounds like I live in the boonies, but Ingersoll isn't that far from London. But it is good to have each one of you on. I see some faces and some names and some phone numbers. So it's good to have each one on. Let's read in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I don't know if you're going to turn to new technology or old technology, right? There is, there is something here that's wireless, is battery-free, and it always works. And there are other things that are more modern, but so I don't know if you have it on a, on a device or if you have a physical Bible or, or if you don't have a Bible, you can just listen. I will be reading and going over the same passage a few times. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, this is this little this little section is like um, a jam-packed sandwich with a lot of things. So I hope we're not intimidated as we read this and hear all of these things. I'm going to try to go through a lot of the phrases here and and kind of explain them briefly. But I trust that you'll be able to follow along. And even if you don't have the scriptures in front of you, that you'll be able to follow along with the repetition. So it's good to have each one of you here tonight. And the gospel message is good news. And it, it goes far beyond even just being able to help us in our social needs. Or there are even the times that we're in are very uncertain. There are many who are suffering there are various needs, and there are tremendous things that are really far beyond our, our ability to help. Otherwise, right, we would be out of this COVID situation and what many people call back to normal. But obviously, there are, there are big things, factors in play here. But as you think of the gospel, maybe, maybe you know, some people maybe think that, well, it is a good news. It is a positive news. It has a, a positive influence on your life, and it can help you overcome some difficulties and some problems, and it certainly does that. I remember somebody commenting how much more money they had after they became a Christian. There is, there is less that they spent on, on other things, unnecessary things, unnecessary addictions. So there are, yes, many positive benefits. But as I was thinking of this chapter, I want us to notice that the Lord Jesus Christ came to deal with the root problem, and the root problem is sin. And we're going to notice that as we go through it. The root problem, yes, what we do is, is harmful, is bad, and we have to be aware of that. But just for tonight, I wanted to focus on what we have in this passage. It speaks about the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. So let's break right into here in verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So Paul has been speaking about the struggle that a believer feels in their life, even as a believer, and it was something that he felt in his struggle against sin. For example, he said, I find then a law when I would do good, evil is present with me. So there's this influence. He's aware of this force even with, within him as a Christian, as a believer, as someone who had accepted Christ as a savior. But if he tried to overcome sin and the power of sin on his own, 
he realized that he wasn't able to. And so there was this struggle that he describes in chapter 7, but then he does come to a conclusion. There is victory. There is hope, right? Otherwise, we don't have a, a hopeless message for you tonight. It is a message of hope. And he breaks in here in chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So there's no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. So who are those who are in Christ Jesus? The passage speaks about those who are in Christ Jesus and those who are in the flesh. So there's only two groups, in Christ Jesus or in the flesh. And once again, as we're developing this, this basic idea, you'll, you'll notice that those who are in the flesh are those who are being controlled, are under the influence, under the authority of this sinful nature. So I'm going to try to step through it slowly, right? So there is these two laws, the law of sin and the law of the spirit. So those who are in Christ are those who we would say are saved. They've been born again. They belong to the Lord Jesus. Remember the Lord Jesus said that I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he spoke of himself as the door of the sheep and the shepherd. And those who belonged to him were part of his, his sheepfold, his herd, his, his, the sheep that belonged to him, and he took care of them. So you can think of someone who is in Christ is being protected by Christ. Then going on in the verse, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So once again, here is talking about what characterizes the daily influences in a person's life. Once again, we're not focusing on what a person does, but we're focusing on what it is that is governing, what is influencing, what are these forces that are acting in a person's life. And we have here who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we've detailed these two forces. I, I, I don't want to call the spirit a force, but just for a bit of a comparison, the flesh. What is the flesh? So we think of flesh, right? It is something to do with our natural, our physical body. And we're going to notice it later on. It is something that we are born with. It is the sinful nature. It is a tendency that always pushes towards sin. And it is heartless. It never stops. It is always on. And it is always pushing towards sin. Because that's the only thing that the flesh or our sinful nature does. And that's what Paul has been struggling with in chapter 7. So a believer, a Christian, still has it. And we need to recognize this very real influence in us, causing us to sin. So, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because Paul wants us to know, to know fully, that there is some, something greater than the flesh, someone greater than the flesh, and that is the Holy Spirit. So, let's just go on in verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life, in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So now, in verse 1, he talked about the flesh and the spirit. But now he talks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And contrary to that, is the law of sin and death. So there's two laws. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, you know what? The government passes laws, and then sometimes people obey them, and sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes they obey the government's laws outside where people can see, and then they don't, not where they're hidden. And maybe we're thinking of laws that way, right? Or sometimes the government passes laws, and they have to go back on them, or because of public outcry. So what is, how should we understand the word law here? I see there's, there's kids on. I know there's kids on in the, in the background. Maybe there's others who aren't as familiar with what this passage is talking about. What is it talking about with a law? So I've already talked about the influence, the flesh as a force that works. 
Let's talk about this law. Yesterday, we were doing some demolition work here at our house. I know we've been doing it inside the house for some time, but we're doing demolition work outside on the treehouse. So the laws of nature have been working on the wood of our treehouse and it's been rotting and it's been tilting. And one of the, the ice storm a few years ago took out one of the main support branches that was supporting this treehouse. And so I've been picking away at it. And finally yesterday I, I got up and took away most of, most of the wood and we had fun yanking the rest of it down with a, a long rope, right? We at a safe distance and you pull it down, make sure it doesn't take anything else with it. But then at the end, after we were cleaning everything up and I realized that there's a long board full of nails and screws hanging down beside the kid's slide. I thought, you know what, that's, that's rather dangerous. So I went up and as I stepped forward to dislodge it, my foot went through the, the rotten board. And it, it surprised Peter, it really surprised me. Um, anyway, I caught myself and nothing, nothing really happened. But what was happening? Why did I, why did my foot go through the rotten board and you know up to past the knee? And why did I have to catch myself and keep from falling down into the, you know, the whatever, the branches of the tree? What was acting on me? It's the law of gravity, right? You understand that. We understand the effects of gravity. If I, if I pick something up, right, it falls. And I, unless I'm supporting it, it is, it is going to fall. So it's not that I chose to obey the law of gravity. It's not that, you know, somebody said, okay, today the law of gravity is going to work and tomorrow it isn't. We understand that the law of gravity is always on. It's always functioning. And we're thankful for that, right? It, um, we can't imagine what it would be like if there were no gravity. But the law of gravity is something that is always on. And it always pulls down, right? It always pulls down. So as I think of this law of sin and death, it's helpful to think of it because that's what it is. This law is something, is an influence, it is a force, it is something that is always governing, it is always on, it is always working. It never stops, it never takes a break, it never has a long weekend, it is actually working overtime, all the time, and it only does one thing. This law of sin that is at work in each one of us and every single person throughout the world can only sin. And that's what it's doing. It's just constantly. So not that the law of gravity is sinful. You're going to understand that. But in the sense where gravity is always working and always pulls down. Verse 2 speaks about a law of sin and death. So it speaks about. It qualifies. This type of a law. As sin and death. So when you think of sin. I think, I hope we have it clear that sin is what causes separation. Sin is what causes sadness. Sin is what causes suffering. Sin is what causes disease. Sin is what causes all of these social problems. Sin is what causes fights between brothers and sisters. Sin is what causes loneliness. Sin is what causes all of these difficulties. That's what sin does. And we shouldn't be surprised because that's the only thing that sin can do. Sin and death. If there were no sin, there'd be no death. Think about it. What would, what would your Monday be like? What would have your Sunday be, been like if there was no sin and no death? It would have been totally different. So, there's this law of sin and death that is working and is functioning, not functioning the way we want it to, but it is always working, causing sin and havoc and destruction, making us all slaves, all prisoners. And, you know, even the devil is subject to sin. The devil isn't, isn't in control. The devil isn't doing, you know, 
isn't free. The devil is actually a slave of sin. He is self-tricked, self-deceived, and he's doing everything he can to cause as much pain and suffering and as he can. He knows that he is already condemned. He's just fighting against God. So we have that on one side, the law of sin and death. But we have another law, a greater law, a law that opposes this law of sin and death, but it's not an equal and opposite law. It is actually far greater and far better than this law. So we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So once again, it is a law. It is something that operates and functions and is constantly working. But different from the law of sin and death, this is a person. It is a spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we have the Holy Spirit of God who gives life. He loves. He cares. There's a positive nature to this. And as we think of a bit of a, the difference here between the law of sin and death, that always pulls down, and the law of the spirit of life, which always, which is for simplicity, always pulls up, right? Something is positive. I was thinking of what we did a few weeks ago with the uh, kids in Sunday school. We talked about the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. So first, one of the cycles is, or one of the, um, the stages, you have a nice little caterpillar, fat, juicy caterpillar on a leaf, a milkweed leaf, and all it does is it just munches and munches and munches and eats and just crawls around on the leaf. And that's all the caterpillar can do. And then a little while later, after the everything you know goes through some more stages, you see this beautiful butterfly emerge with orange and black and all these very, very intricate, delicate features in this butterfly. And you'll notice that, you know, the butterfly doesn't eat what the caterpillar ate. The butterfly doesn't look like the caterpillar. But there's another difference. This caterpillar has, or sorry, this butterfly has something built in, a, a different characteristic that the caterpillar never had. It can do something that the caterpillar could not physically do. The butterfly can fly. It can spread its wings and, you know, through the various generations in the summer, it will fly from place to place collecting nectar. And it, we've all seen how beautiful they are. It, maybe you follow them. Maybe you've tried to catch them. You know, maybe you've tried to help them, but they're beautiful. Now, what's one of the differences between this butterfly and this caterpillar? Why is the butterfly able to fly and go up, up, up? Why is the butterfly able to travel all the way to Mexico as it migrates? Does the law of gravity not function, doesn't work on the butterfly? No, you know that the law of gravity is still on, is still active. But this butterfly has something that the caterpillar didn't. It has this ability, this power to overcome the law of gravity. And that's what I think of when I think of this law of the spirit of life. Now, I want us to, I think you understand that this doesn't totally encompass all of what we're talking about, but it hopes it gives us a mental picture of, of the type of thing we're talking about. We're talking about, Paul's talking about two laws, a law of sin, a law of sin and death that goes down, takes us down, takes us to destruction, is sadness, it is sorrow, it is darkness, and eventually leads to, yes, physical death. The Bible says that right now, those who aren't saved, those who haven't been born again, are existing in spiritual death, in darkness, and they're separated from God. And are being worked on and subject to under the authority of this law of sin and death. But the gospel, and the reason why Paul was so excited to share the gospel and to preach the gospel, is because because of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
There is another law. There's this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that is able to overcome this law of sin and death in every possible sense. And I just want us to have this clear picture. Sometimes people focus a lot on what we do. And you're right. What we do is sin. And that's the verse. The verses talk about that. These verses right here talk about sinning. But let's go back to the root. And that's what the gospel can do. And that's what we can share with you tonight. Let's go on to verse, verse 3. It says, what the law could not do. Now here we have, which law is this talking about? Is it the law of sin? Or is it the law of the spirit that we've talked about? Well, if you look in verse 4, it says the righteousness of the law. So it seems to be describing what we call the law of Moses, but it is the law that God gave to his people and it governed all aspects of life, the moral, the civil, the buying of property, of debts, of canceling debts, and, and all of that that God gave to his earthly people, the Israelites, the Jews, and they were to govern, use that to govern every aspect of their lives. Now, we were familiar with the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill, no lying, no stealing, don't covet, honor your father and mother, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And, and they took that law and they took it as a way that would effectively help them to win the struggle against the sin that was inside of them. Rather than turn to God and seek his help, admitting that they were sinners and that they had, were failing at it, they used this law to try to justify themselves. So the law that God gave is good. I mean, God only does good things. Everything he does is perfect. What, but he says here, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. So once again, we have this expression, the flesh, and he's pulling together these, the fact that the sin nature, the sin power, the way it, it presents itself in us, is the flesh. And Romans 5 and 8 says that sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through him. And we have all been born with this sin nature. Sin. And in case there is anybody who has any doubt as to whether or not that is true, there's two things in that verse in Romans 5 that are indicators that show that all of us are subject to what that verse says, the sin nature, the flesh that came from Adam. First of all, we all sin. The question is not whether or not we've, we struggle with sin and try not to sin. That's a good thing, right? But the fact is, the fact that we struggle with sin shows that we are subject to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ did not struggle personally in, in himself with a sinful nature. He didn't have that sinful nature, but you and I have that. The other fact, undeniable fact, that shows that we are subject to the sin nature that we got from Adam is we are all subject to death. Every one of us. There are many who deny that we are sinners. There are many who might try to deny that they are maybe, you know, I'm not a very serious sinner. But we are all subject to death. And that demonstrates that each one of us has the sinful nature, the flesh that we got from Adam. And try as we might want to, we cannot use rules or the law to overcome this sinful nature. Now, verse 3 continues, What the law could not do, and that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, there's, there's a, a play on words here. but So first of all, notice it says God sending his own Son. So there is a problem. The problem is the fact that we're sinners. 
problem is because we're sinners, we sin. We are subject to sin. We are under the influence and the control of sin. And we all face death. But God has done something. It says here, God. God stepped in. God did something. God sending his own son. So this reminds us of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give his own son? Why did he give his own beloved son? It says God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came and in every way, exactly in appearance, such as we are, as a regular human being, as, as if, right, I'm looking at sinful flesh, and you're looking at sinful flesh, and the Lord Jesus Christ looked exactly like we did. But of course we know he was sin apart. He, he could not sin. He didn't have the sinful nature in him. He wasn't subject to death. He wasn't subject to the control of sin. He didn't struggle with sin. When the devil came to try to tempt him, the devil had nothing to work on. He tried to play with him. He tried to the same way he did with Adam and Eve, the same way he so effectively does with us. But the, the Lord Jesus had nothing in him to respond to sin. And that's why it says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, a true human being without sin. But it says he came for sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And it should really grab us. It should stop us. It's kind of like we should be struck by, by how astounding it is that Christ died. The one who is God, the one who came into this world, the one who was not subject to sin the way you and I are, and yet it says Christ died. But why did he die? He says Christ died for our sins. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, who was not subject to death, went into death. He suffered for our sins on the cross. He suffered the punishment that we deserved because that's what he came to do. It says God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. That's why he came. He came for sin. Condemned sin in the flesh. So it is a, as in a court of law where the evidence is, is all laid out and the, the verdict is condemned. The Lord Jesus Christ, by his life and by his death, he has condemned sin. He has trapped it. He, has, he is victor over sin. And now, because he has done that, because he has won the victory, because the one who wasn't subject to death wasn't trapped by sin the way you and I are. He went into death. He died for our sins. And the verse says he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul is able to tell you there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who are under the influence, not of the flesh merely. Yes, we still have the flesh, but is the Spirit of God. So that's the good news. The good news of the gospel that we can have tonight. It's, it's a beautiful evening. I see the sun hasn't gone down. It's, um, I know I can see a lot of you in your faces that you're, you still got the, the sun shining on the, through the window. And it's a wonderful thing. But it's another little reminder that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he is the source of life. He is the source of all that is wonderful and good. And because the Lord Jesus Christ was sent into the world to be the Savior, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise again the third day, 
whoever believes in him can have this everlasting life. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, we think of this problem of sin. The Lord Jesus dealt with the problem of sin. He dethroned sin. We know that Adam, when he gave in to the devil, he, he became a servant of sin. But the Lord Jesus Christ said that if the Son will set you free, you shall be free indeed. So our Father, we've, we've gone through this passage. We've talked about difficult things. We've talked about very, very personal things. The fact that each one of us has this sin nature in us, that we are subject to sin and that we are headed for, for death. We know that. That is the expectation that each one has. The Bible says it is appointed unto us once to die. But our Father, we thank Thee for the Lord Jesus Christ because He came. We thank Thee that He has broken the power of sin. We thank Thee that, that there is this law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we pray for those who have heard the message tonight. We pray that the believers would be encouraged. But if there are those who aren't saved, who are still in, as, as the, the passage says, they that are in the flesh, we pray that they would, they would turn to thee and receive the salvation that thou art able to give. We commit ourselves to thee now. We are surrounded by, by much suffering by much unrest, maybe even, we know that it is even affecting us personally. But our Father, we're thankful for the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And we thank Thee for the wonderful prospect believers have that we know the Lord Jesus Christ could come and even physical death would be avoided because our Father, there is no limit to the work that Christ finished on the cross. So we commit the evening to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.